I order this square of grass for my dog to pee on so that I don't have to go outside very late at night. And I did it for safety and I did it for weather. But this morning when I took him out for an actual walk, I ran into a friend and we chatted for 10 minutes. That's something we often speak about, which is the cost of conveniences. I don't have to go to the library. I can get it on my Kindle. I don't have to go to the movies. We can get it on Netflix. One of the tasks I actually give to clients every now and then is to list all those conveniences conveniences where you don't have to leave the house. What would happen if you took two of those away? And yeah, it would take more time, but do you also position yourself for all those serendipitous moments everybody's dreaming of? So many of us yearn for those moments, but we've also created a lifestyle that's wildly dependent upon these apps that make it so convenient that we don't ever have to leave home. And I don't know to what degree that's long-term a benefit. Hey everyone, I'm Jean Chatsky. Thanks so much for joining me today on Her Money. We know that our connections to our families, our friends, and our communities are so important. So important that when we don't maintain them, our health and our overall well-being can really suffer. According to a 2023 study from doctors at University College in London, lacking social connection qualifies as a risk factor for Premature mortality, it's strongly associated with lower physical and mental health. Essentially, it's telling us that maintaining strong emotional bonds is what keeps us happy and healthy. And this trickles down into all other areas of our lives. Yet at the same time, we also know that making time to see our family and our friends is getting harder and more expensive than ever. And it may feel like enough, yes, that's enough in air quotes, to sit on your couch while you text the people that you love, but really, it's not. Maintaining our connections in real life is essential, and perhaps nobody knows that better than our guest, Danielle Bayard-Jackson. She is known as the friendship expert on TikTok, where she's got over 300,000 followers. We'll be talking with her about how societal changes, cultural obstacles, and personal expectations have changed the way we maintain our most important relationships. Danielle, welcome. So great to have you here. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. You took a big detour in your life. You left the classroom, the high school classroom, to focus on friendships. What made you do that? And then can we talk a little bit about the importance of friendship in our lives today? Sure, yeah. You know, I often joke by saying that Becoming a friendship coach certainly wasn't on my vision board when I was 10. It was not a thing. But I was a high school English teacher for 12th graders. And between classes and after school, it's the number one thing they wanted to talk about. And then I was promoted to the chair of the department. And it quickly became a focus of our department meetings because we were realizing we can't even get through solid instruction if Susie's not talking to Betsy and Tasha's mad at so-and-so and and they're not coming to school because they don't have a group. And so we kind of had a front row seat to the ways that issues of connection and belonging were impacting everything else. So after six years, I got into public relations and made the foolish mistake of thinking I was leaving that teenage drama behind, you know, but I was surprised to learn that I was working with these high achieving, charismatic, often extroverted professional women and secretly behind the scenes, they had friendship issues too. And so for the past six years, I've been leveraging my background in education to study what the research has to say around women's cooperation, communication, and conflict. And to your question about why friendship, you know, is so important, I think what continues to surprise me is the direct connections between the state of our social relationships and our physical, mental, and emotional health. That continues to surprise me, and I hope that it gives us even more of a sense of urgency to figure out how to create and maintain quality platonic relationships. What I think is so fascinating is the connection that you made from high school to the adult workplace, specifically the workplace for women. When you look at the difference between the women who are adults and the girls who are still in high school. What do you see? What have we learned by the time that we're your age or my age? And what have we not learned? 
I, I get that question sometimes, like, what are the differences? And I always say, not much, because while the details may have changed, while our lifestyles and, and obligations may have changed, at the heart of the conflicts we're experiencing with one another are the questions, where are my people? Where can I be loved? Where can I express my love freely? Where am I safe? Where do I belong? Feelings of fear of being rejected, those things are the same. Perhaps the way that we cope with them look different, the way we cover those things up, the stories we tell ourselves are different. But those themes tend to carry through no matter if you're 19 or if you're 47. And I just, I try to announce that as much as I can so that we can see that friendship seems to be the great equalizer. And it doesn't matter your background. We're all out here trying to figure out how can I find my people and show up authentically? I think that's just like the question of the ages. Well, I think to that end, finding your people and showing up authentically these days more than most means overcoming some of the cultural and environmental obstacles that you talk about in your book that are getting in the way of our friendships. First, more cars on the road, less walkable cities. I happen to live in a walkable city these days. I live in Center City, Philadelphia, which is incredibly walkable, but I spent 30 years in the suburbs, which was not incredibly walkable. So I, I get the difference. How has that affected friendship overall? Oh, yeah. So I like to talk about this often on social media because it gets such a, a chatter going. But when we look at how there are, being, there are more cars that are on the road than naturally, you know, our infrastructure is being adapted to accommodate that, so more highways and this and that. And a lot of people long for the days where you could just walk down the street to your friend's house and the market was a couple blocks over and where you worked was a couple blocks over. But, you know, there are so many obviously great benefits to, to globalization and things like that. But does that mean that you can now move wherever you want and you're no longer tied to a certain area? When we look at the question of routes, being rooted somewhere. What does that mean? In all of this mobilization, it comes at what cost? And so people will often tell me, depending on where they're living, when you look at how long it would take to commute to see your friend, when you look at the money for the Uber to get to your friend, when you look at how you're tired after work, and now the idea of going across town. So those are very real, practical, everyday barriers to these decisions of do I go see my friends or do I not? Can I afford it? Do I have the time? Uh, and so they tend to be things that, that get in the way of seeing our people. In terms of screens and the amount of life that we now don't have to go outside the house to accomplish, we can order our groceries, we shop online. I mean, there's so many different things that we no longer have to go outside to do that I would imagine that gets in the way of just finding your people and meeting your people. Oh, absolutely. That's something we often speak about, which is the cost of conveniences. So to your point, I don't have to go to the library. I can get it on my Kindle. I don't have to go to the movies. We can get it on Netflix. I mean, very convenient, sure. But one of the tasks I actually kind of give to clients every now and then, which surprises them, but is to t list all those conveniences where you don't have to leave the house, post office, whatever, and, and list them out. What would happen if you took two of those away? And yeah, it would take more time, but do you also position yourself for all those serendipitous moments everybody's dreaming of where you're chatting up the person behind you or, or waiting in line or sharing recommendations in aisle nine? I mean, I don't mean to romanticize them, but so many of us yearn for those moments, but we've also created a lifestyle that's wildly dependent upon these apps and things like that, that make it so convenient that we don't ever have to leave home. And I don't know to what degree that's long-term a benefit. It's so funny. The one that I flashed on as you were talking about those things is that I order this square of grass that gets delivered every three weeks, every four weeks, depending on the season for my dog to pee on so that I don't have to go outside <laughs> very, very early in the morning or very, very late at night. And I did it for safety and I did it for weather. But this morning when I took him out for an actual walk, I ran into a friend and we chatted for 10 minutes. And that would not have happened if I took him to pee on the patch. So oh. um, <laughs> there you go. That's a beautiful example. The, there's also, and I think it's especially pertinent as we head into this election season, there's this thinning of trust in America, in our 
education system, in our government, but also in people who don't think like we do. We were talking about this also this weekend. My husband went to his high school reunion where growing up, you really had no idea whose politics were what, at least not to the degree that we do today. And also, I don't think it used to bother us the way it does today. How do you deal with that factor? Yeah, when I was learning about this, I was I was looking at um, studies that were conducted by Pew Research Center talking about our thinning trust in certain institutions like the education system and, and our government and, and things like that. And a lot of things have transpired to make people kind of question their faith in these systems. And I get that. But it also said that we have thinning trust in one another and America more so than other countries. And, you know, to some degree, I do understand that. You know, I've got two little ones. So when they want to play outside or people come around, I'm like, oh, I don't know. You know, so I've got some of that too. But we do have to ask ourselves, what are the long-term consequences of these attitudes? Are you less likely to develop a relationship with the person in your neighborhood because you you don't know, you're a little paranoid and I don't know these people, right? There's so much othering in terms of different groups. But I mean, that's literally the beauty of America and the beauty of, of meeting strangers is I don't know what we have in common instead of leading with the question of I don't know. If this person's going to be one of those people, whatever that means, right, what do we have in common? And so, yeah, that does contribute to a larger breakdown in our social infrastructure is to be so paranoid with one another. I started the show talking about the barriers, the financial barriers that sometimes get in the way of our friendships. Because I, I was just, I mean, for the record, having a conversation with my daughter, Julia, this morning. She is of the age where she is going to a lot of bachelorette parties, but it's not just her. I am going to the eighth wedding of a friend's child this year, this weekend. And that is adds up to, and I'm almost 60, I'm not of the bachelorette age, friendships are expensive and it can cause strife. Oh, absolutely. First of all, God bless your social calendar because that is that is just wild. But, you know, it's a lot. There's a lot going on. And unfortunately, a lot of our connection with our friends happens upon a social backdrop that requires funds, whether it's something as simple as let's grab coffee and you're doing that multiple times a week, or as you just mentioned, these grander occasions like the baby showers, the weddings where people especially expect you to show up. And in most cases, they see it as a gesture or a sign of your support for the friendship overall which makes some people feel like it's not an option to opt out without risking the state of the friendship itself. How did we get here? Well, when we look at how friendships have evolved, not just through the pandemic, but over, over time in America with the way that we work and the way that we live, it feels very different to me than it felt when I was working in my 20s and 30s and even early 40s when a lot of my friends were either work-based or train-based. I commuted on a, on a train for two hours a day into and out of New York City. I had train friends and those were solid friendships and they cost me nothing beyond the ticket that I paid to commute that I would have bought anyway. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know it's normal for us to often point to social media as the root of all our ails, but I will say I've heard many women tell me that if social media did not exist, it would make them think twice about um, the things that they did when they got together with their friends. So I do get kind of curious about how that factor kind of sneakily, stealthily plays a role that you know that whatever it is you do is going to be observed by others and the ways in which that might influence the decisions you make about how big you go on the bachelorette if you know that it's going to be in tons of photos or how you know you design the decor for your wedding because you know that it's going to be in photos and so you know i think for a lot of us we might think about our friendship hangouts in terms of the aesthetics even if subconsciously and that can that can be tricky and that can certainly add up talk a little bit more about that I mean, how do we tend to expect each other to, when you put symmetry and support together, it, it mm -hmm. starts to make sense for me, right? 
you we went out for your birthday now we have to go out for my birthday and we have to spend the same amount on your birthday that we did on my birthday and if you don't show up because you've got something going on that night that doesn't lend the same amount of symmetry or support am i on the right track you nailed it you nailed it yeah if anything we expect if if nothing else exists i expect that my friend bare minimum offer emotional support but when we tie emotional support to hey over the past couple of years i've been supporting the baby shower this is not and you can't do that for me it becomes really tricky well you know sometimes our our financial situations are fluid so maybe i was in a place where i could do certain things six years ago but now i can't you know one example i often give is you know i was one of the first in my friend group to get married have a baby do the whole things so by the time my maid of honor was getting married I was in a different situation. I was in transition between the coaching thing and I couldn't do the thousands of dollars, three day bachelorette with the new baby, a new career. I wasn't able to do it. And so I had to try to find a way to, how can I show her? I support you even though I can't show up financially in this way. And it was tricky. Well, how did you do it? And I, I mean, what did you, what did you say to her? What did you, I assume you're still friends to this day. We actually did not speak for four years. And just recently I reached out to her after not speaking and there was no drama. We just kind of faded and we had a long talk. We kind of circled back around a lot of things. And one piece of that conversation was me telling her exactly why I couldn't go. I did not tell her the first time. Um, I, I just said, you know, I've got the new baby and there's so much going on. It felt very embarrassing and shameful to say, I can't afford to to party for four days and the hotels and the outfits that we have to change. I can't afford it right now. And so I found a way during the time to say, you know what, you know, everybody's first drink is on me and I'm gonna Venmo the, you know, the maid of honor or, and, and I'm gonna have her buy all the things, but that's all that I could do. And so four years later on the phone, this was a few months ago, I told her, you know, I couldn't afford it. And she was like, I, I know you have an issue with trying to look strong and like you can do all the things, but I wish you would have told me because she interpreted it as you would imagine as, as something different, a lack of a lack of support. Yeah. It, yeah. Sometimes it is so hard to talk about money in general. It is even harder to acknowledge when we can't do something for financial reasons, no matter where we sit on the economic spectrum. And I, I agree with you. I think, I think if we could only get ourselves to the place where we could say those four, I can't afford it words we would be in in a much, much better place. You've got some tactical suggestions, and I know this is what you do with the people that you work with. You coach them to healthier friendships where money doesn't necessarily get in the way. So I want to get into your framework for healthy friendships. You call it the friendship files, F-I-L-E-S, the things that you need to examine in yourself before you can enjoy healthy friendships. Take me through them one one piece at a time, starting with the F, which stands for fear. Yeah, so a lot of people's decisions are driven by fear. I'm noticing that just in life in general, but especially when it comes to friendship. So think about a decision that you are making impulsively or a decision that you are reluctant to lean into how much of that decision is determined by fear. So it can be as simple as, you know, reaching out to an old friend who you think about often, but what if she rejects you? What if she's suspicious as to why you're reaching out? So questioning how much of it is motivated by being afraid. Um, the I stands for identity. And I know that's like a, a hot topic as we think about intersectional identities, but who are you? I mean, truly, who are you? Uh, one exercise we do with clients is to have them complete the statement, I am blank multiple times and how would you complete that with the various ways that you identify and coming up with that and generating that list helps us to see maybe some direction for where you should be moving your feet to find your people so for me i am black i am a woman i'm a mother i'm a creative am i in communities that affirm each one of those identities that can get me closer to finding my people so identity is really important the l stands for love which is you know a nice gushy feel good word but how do you practice love with the people in your life? Do you withhold it when you're mad? Are you punitive? I mean, what does love look like to you? And to really start to define something that feels so obvious, how do you really practice that actively in your connections? And could you stand to be more active in practicing love instead of sentimental? Well, my friends know I love them. Do they? 
And so we talk about getting tangible with that. The E is for expectations. I've often heard it said that friendship is the most ambiguous relationship you'll ever have. Because in all the other contexts, as a mom, as a wife, you know the terms and conditions. I know how this mm-hmm. thing is supposed to go. But what about with friendship? We're all walking around with different ideas of what you ought to do as a friend, how much communication is too much and what you're expected to do and showing up. Well, what does it look like to kind of look at your own expectations and the expectations of your friends and find alignment to minimize or at least reduce uh, moments of misunderstanding? And the S finally stands for selfishness, which is not a feel good word, Mm -hmm. but I mean, we're just keeping it real. When you are with your friends, how much do your preferences come first? And if your friends make choices different than yours, what happens next? And so to really look at how much do I come front and center in my friendships and to what degree am I willing to be compromising and inconvenienced sometimes? And that's a delicate dance. We don't want to be people pleasers, but For some of us, we do have to question, how often do I come first? And so those friendship files or walking around those mental files can kind of help to serve as a barometer of how we're doing when it comes to establishing healthy friendships. I think the last two on your list, the expectations and the selfishness, actually bring us right back to the money because there are expectations for what you'll do, when you'll show up, how much you'll spend to participate in these relationships. Saying no is, I think, a when, when you need to say no for the health of your financial life can be read as selfish, but in fact, it's really important. So as you look at these files, how do you set healthy financial expectations and boundaries so that you can maintain your friendships with integrity? That's a great question um, and so important to, to preserving our friendships in a very tangible way. The first is to remember that your financial boundaries are first internal because a lot of times we project and we get mad at the friend who asked, but you know your limitations. So am I breaking a boundary within myself? I know that I feel comfortable spending this much, but do I exceed it because this person asked me to because the resentment, half of it is at myself because I know most intimately and accurately what I'm able to do. So for a lot of us, we're breaking commitments to ourselves about what's appropriate or not to spend. And then the second thing is lead with something I like to refer to as affirmative boundaries, where I'm gonna highlight what I can do instead of focusing on what I can't do. And the subtext is the same, right? The subtext is still, I can't go to Greece for your birthday next weekend. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's a little more positive. So instead of, oh, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't. First of all, we're not apologizing for our financial situation. If you can't, there's no shame. We're not apologizing. And the second thing is, what can you do? So maybe it's, oh, you know, with some other things I've committed to, financially, that's not gonna fit into my plan. But when you get back, me and you, I am taking you on a lunch date. I want every detail. Or I I can make it playful, but hey, send me the pictures that you can't post on social. Send those to me along the journey because I need to know. You know, so it's playful and it's not apologetic, but I'm letting you know I am here. I do want to know about the trip. I am invested in this experience. I'm not going to be able to join you physically. Or it's, you know, I can come for the first day, but because of work, I got to get back. But, you know, what can I do to make it up to you once you get back, right? So hopefully the right people can respect that. And I think some of us are nervous to share those boundaries and limitations because, one, we don't want our support questioned. But a lot of us, we, I believe, I think we know that the friendship has a certain level of fragility and it would only Mm -hmm. be exposed because the right friends will understand the wrong friends will not be able to extend understanding. And and I think the right friends are able to be compassionate, disappointed, yes, but compassionate and understanding of your situation. What do you do with the wrong friends? You would have to get really honest with yourself about what being in that relationship means to you because relationships are not just relationships, like these insular relationships, but it represents something. For a lot of us, we're willing to go past those financial boundaries because it says something to finally belong to a group like this. 
It makes me feel like I'm finally that person I've always wanted to be to travel in this pack, if we're being honest. But if you really want freedom, you have to remember the right people want the data on how to love you well. The right friends want to know. I know that if a friend, if I found out a friend was joining me on a trip, but she couldn't really afford to be there and she was kind of, I know that I would feel insulted that she would, didn't tell me. I'd feel bad that she came and couldn't afford to. I wouldn't want her to, right? So the right people want you to feel safe and to feel secure. And um, once you find that that's been exposed and you have people who are not there for you for the right reasons, you'd have to do a lot of internal self-work around why you're really signed up for this and really remember that even though there's discomfort in the short term, it frees you up in the long term to be available for the right connections. Danielle Bayard Jackson, the book is called Fighting for Our Friendships, The Science and Art of Conflicted Connection in Women's Relationships. Thank you so much for kicking us off today. Thank you for having me.